All right. Welcome, everyone, to another session of uh, PHI's 2023 Educational Series. Um, at today's town hall, we will be discussing physical therapy. Um, I'm pleased to welcome today's guest, Carolyn De Silva. Carolyn is a, a board-certified neurologic clinical specialist. Uh, she is a full professor in the School of Physical Therapy at Texas Women's University. Uh, teaching entry-level graduate students how to become physical therapists and providing post-professional mentorship to PTs in the Houston area and Houston area neurologic physical therapy residency programs and the TWU, TWU PhD program. Uh, she's worked as a physical therapist at Tier Memorial Herman Rehabilitation and Research's Medical Specialty Post-Polio Outpatient Clinic since 1998 and continues to provide part-time inpatient rehabilitation care at Memorial Hermann Hospital, Texas Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Uh, her research interests include fear and predictors of falling and aging with disability. Uh, some of you here may already be familiar with her as she is a past recipient of a PHI research grant and has been published in our newsletter. Uh, and some of you may have even participated in some of her surveys or in-person research. Uh, just before we begin, just a couple of housekeep housekeeping items I want to get out of the way. Um, after the presentation, we will open it up for questions. Um, you can simply use the raise hand feature at the bottom of your screen, and I'll try to call on you in the order you raise your hands. Or uh, some of you be, may be more comfortable using the Q&A feature and typing in your questions. Uh, we'll try to get to those in a timely fashion as well. Um, again, we will be recording today's session if you want to watch it later or have to leave for any reason. Uh, we will be uh, posting that recording on our website um, and also on our YouTube channel and Facebook page. So uh, keep an eye out for that as well. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to today's presenter. Well, thank you, Brian, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for joining us on well, here in Houston, it's in the afternoon. Um, you might be in different time zones where it could be the middle of the night or whatever. But uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and get to the presentation. And then we should have plenty of time for your questions and answers. Okay, so um, at, at the beginning of this, I do have my email address and I welcome people to contact me, um, you know, along the way in your journey uh, with post polio syndrome, I get random emails from people on a regular basis so don't worry about bothering me um, there. That's not a good word, I think. Um, but anyway, uh, I again, I'm very happy to be here today. So I think it's kind of funny how physical therapy has changed and how it hasn't. So here's a couple of pictures from the 1950s or early 60s. And um, this is a then young clinician, Dr. Laura K. Smith, that some of you may have interacted with in your polio journeys. Um, she was a young physical therapist during the polio epidemics. And, and then she went on to start the School of Physical Therapy at Texas Women's University, uh, as well as UT medical branch in Galveston. And then she was the one that with Dr. Halstead started learning um, and exploring people with post polio and trying to figure out what it was that was causing it and what the common presentations were and those kinds of things. But bottom line is we're still doing, okay, how are we going to transfer in and out of a bathtub? And, and what about water therapy and those kinds of things? Certainly the equipment and things look a little bit different and the swimsuits look a little different, but uh, we're doing some of the same things. So what can physical therapists do today to help polio survivors with and without post-polio syndrome? So there's general ways that we can help. And so I work as part of a post-polio clinic at Tier Memorial Hermann. Um, some clinics will be multidisciplinary. Our particular clinic in, 
uh, on a regular basis, we have the physician who is a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. And at this time, her name is Dr. Lisa Wenzel. Uh, I am there routinely. And then we have a social worker that is there routinely as well. Upon request, we might get respiratory therapy involved to take certain measurements with that. Our patients that need a wheelchair specialty services, they would actually be referred to a separate uh, clinic visit for wheelchair activities. But some clinics in the United States might have all the services there on site right there. But bottom line is we are providing a comprehensive examination of you and the things that you have going on with you. Um, some of our uh, people have very... Uh, I don't know, routine things that we look at and we examine and we get through things pretty readily. And some people can be very, very complex in their presentation and in their questions and, and everything. So it just really depends. But, you know, we could spend literally four hours with a patient between the doctor and myself and the social worker. Um, during this time in the post polio clinic, we provide extensive education about, okay, these issues that you're having, yes, they do seem to be related to your history of polio, or these other things might be related to a different diagnosis, and maybe this different diagnosis, if you do have it, could be a treatable diagnosis that might help you then continue to age as gracefully as possible with your history of polio. We do provide referrals for additional tests, um, therapies, equipment, um, specialty services, a lot of different kinds of things in this post-polio clinic. You may also interact with physical therapists in an inpatient setting. If you've had a total knee replacement and you have to go through your total knee rehab program, you might see physical therapists in outpatient clinics uh, for balance retraining or pain management, maybe in nursing facilities and certainly in home health as well. And so these therapists can do all the above um, as relevant to the setting. And then these are going to be the ones that are providing direct interventions and monitor your progress. And then hopefully they would consult back to the post polio clinic as applicable. So frequently, especially with my years and years of experience in the post polio clinic, you know, patients will ask me, well, you know, I don't know how many exercises I should do and I don't know how many reps I should do and, and that kind of thing. And in our particular clinic, I don't provide the day to day services that a person with post polio syndrome would need. I am there, I'm recognizing that, hey, maybe physical therapy can benefit you, or maybe you do need physical therapy, and I will generate the referral. Um, if you are living in an area that I'm familiar with, and I do have uh, a few therapists that I know that are for tremendous uh, care providers, you know, outside of the greater Houston area, and certainly in Louisiana and Oklahoma and a few other places, um, and so I can, you know, refer you to specific people as necessary. But again, I'm not providing the day in and day out type care to folks. So um, it is important that you do have, if, if you are receiving physical therapy, that you do have somebody that can help you through that and monitor how you're doing. So first, um, listening is the first part of your exam. I mean, for us to listen to you, and it's super important for us to understand what your polio related history is and what your past and current medical history is. Because again, there can be some things that are not related to your history of polio. And one of the things that we can commonly see with people is, oh, you know, I've got this burning pain down the outside of my right lower leg. Okay, well, a burning pain on the outside of your, of your lower leg is not a polio thing. It's very important to remember that polio affected the nerves that go to your muscles and they, it did not go to, it did not affect the muscles. I'm sorry. It did not affect the nerves that go to your ability to feel things and to have things like, you know, burning and electrical type uh, sensations and that kind of thing. So again, that would need to be diagnosed and hopefully treated. Um, we also want to learn about your um, physical, your cognitive and or your emotional demands of your work setting, if you're still working, your home life, your hobbies, you know, what are the things that uh, you are physically doing? You know, how many hours are you working a week? How many hours per day? Uh, what are the cognitive challenges of that particular job? And then, you know, how stressful is it? I mean, many people have jobs or their home life that can cause a great deal of stress or some people, um, it, the stress kind of comes and goes and, and those kinds of things. 
And then what about the accessibility of your home, of your workplace and other important places for you, whether it's your family members' homes, um, your church or synagogue or you know, any of those kinds of things. And are you able to access the places that you would like to be? And then have you had prior physical therapy and our occupational therapy? And, and, and I'm guessing that many of you had PT and or OT services back in the day when you had your acute polio, but some of you might not have had any therapy since then. And again, you would be seeing a person now for very different reasons than you did before, most likely. And so anyway, especially if you've had therapy recently, and by recently, I mean in the last few months, the last five years, did you find the therapy to be helpful for you? Or perhaps you didn't find it helpful to you. And why did you not find it helpful? And so it could have been a lack of training in your particular condition. Um, maybe you have um, an issue that is maybe not amenable to being helped by physical therapy. So that would need to be explored. And then um, what, you know, what have been the treatments that you've received before and what were your goals of therapy in the past? And so in your examination, there's a number of things that should be happening. And so, you know, one of the first things that I'll do with people is I will do um, specific muscle testing and we call it manual muscle testing. And so, you know, some of the folks was like, oh, man, I just had a workout because um, we know that muscles have different directions of pull and we need to be able to move our bodies and our body parts against gravity. And so sometimes you might have weakness such that you can't lift, lift your body part against gravity so that I might need to position you into a laying down position or in sideline or something to try to put the muscle where the gravity is going to impact the direction of pull less um, to make it a little bit easier for those muscles to work so that we can grade things very accurately. What I'm seeing as a trend in physical therapy and not only in outpatient land, but also in inpatient environments is there is what's termed functional strength testing where they might have you um, do a five times sit to stand test where you would be asked to stand up and sit down five times in a row, um, hopefully without using your arms or if you did use arms, we'd have to document it and they would measure how long it took you to do that. And so that is considered a measure of functional strength. Now, I know and you know that if you've got one leg that's working very well and one leg that's not working so well, you're going to be putting all that load onto the one muscle or you might even have a particular muscle in even a relatively strong leg that is just not there at all and you could be compensating. And so if that's the only testing that we're doing, we're going to be missing some big reasons or whys as to why you're having some of the problems that you're having. So it is important to have specific uh, strength testing done. There's a variety of different kinds of functional testing that can be done and should be done. And so, you know, when people come into the clinics, like, you know, people are asked to get up from their wheelchairs or from the chair that's next to the plinth or the treatment table. And let me see how you get over onto this table. And are you able to roll over and turn yourself? Well, um, if you're pushing a wheelchair, um, you know, how are you propelling that wheelchair? And then certainly with walking and how are you walking? What things are you walking with? Are you able to walk down the hall and back? Or or are you weaving all over the place? Are you touching the wall because of um, a lack of balance, especially when there's a turnaround component and those kinds of things? Uh, we do look at um, gait speed as well. There's a number of different outcome measures that we can come up with, you know, solid numbers that are great for um, allowing repeat testing, whether it's at the beginning of a physical therapy intervention and then at the end of your month or two months of therapy or whatever. But also for me in the clinic, you know, I might see patients once every six months or once a year or once every five years or once every 10 or 20 years. And so if we have any kind of numbers to compare what you were with in 2013 as compared to today, that's very, very helpful to have those concrete numbers. And that can give us and you a clear understanding of what is going on, but particularly when as it pertains to walking things and balance. And there's a variety of measures that we can do that with. Pain is an important thing to address. Pain is very common in the post-polio population. And so trying to get to the bottom of what is causing the pain and how intense is it and how often do you have the pain and what are some things that aggravate the pain and what are things that kind of that you resort to to kind of calm the pain down. It's a little bit alarming to me when I have people who's like, oh, yo, my pain's the same all day. Really? So it doesn't matter if you're walking or if you're sitting, or if you're lying in bed, it, it hurts exactly the same. Well, you know, and so then I have to do some kind of probing questions to try to get to the bottom of those kinds of things. 
Um, physical therapists can also do mental health screens. And, you know, certainly we're not psychologists, we're not psychiatrists and all that. But I think it is important for us to screen folks for things like depression. And I do have a published article from the past that some of y'all might have participated in the survey in. But, but depression has been related to falls and risk of falling. So that is important for us to look at. Um, as well as certainly if you have depression, it, you know, it has it been treated? Is it being treated currently? Is it being treated adequately and those kinds of things, as well as things like anxiety? So we have general goals for people with post-polio syndrome. And so we have a general goal of you being able to manage yourself, your body and your symptoms, because as you well know, there's no cure for post-polio syndrome. It's just a matter of, can you get things kind of under control specific, uh, specifically? And so some specific musculoskeletal goals that we may have, depending on you know, how you're doing is to decrease and prevent causes of pain. Um, can we decrease abnormally high workloads of certain muscles? Can we correct and minimize postural and gait deviations mechanically? And can we maintain and increase function safety and your quality of life? I think an important thing is that you need to understand that you, as somebody who has post-polio syndrome, if you have post-polio syndrome, but you do not have to get worse. Let me repeat, you do not have to get worse. We have many patients in our clinic that come in and they come in for their um, annual checkups or every couple of year checkups, and they are plugging along okay. They are, you know, their, their strength is remaining about the same. They might be slowing down just a little bit, but hey, we're all getting a little older and a lot of us are slowing down a little bit, um, but they're, they're not having more pain and, and those kinds of things. We have some patients that um, actually get better. And that's so encouraging for us to share that news. Hey, did you realize that your outcome measure for this is actually better than it was you know, when I saw you two years ago? And of course we do have some people that do have a, a continued decline. And then we really try to um, look to explore, you know, why is it that they're getting worse to try to arrest that decline. So treatments and interventions that physical therapists commonly provide for uh, folks with post-polio syndrome will be, again, the patient education, pain reduction, energy conservation strategies, and then exercise considerations. So with patient education, it's important to understand, again, that there's no cure for post-polio syndrome, but then successful self-management can decrease or alleviate your symptoms. Um, a study done, now it's a long time ago, but it was a small study done and published in 1991 that patients who partially comply with or do not comply with recommendations from a post-polio clinic will likely worsen. It was a pretty interesting study. They talked about people that, you know, they got their list of recommendations and the ones that did everything actually wound up doing better over time. The people that kind of pick and choose the things that they wanted to do or could do, they got, uh, they, they declined, but not that much. But the ones that just kind of threw their recommendations out the window, they did significantly decline. So that is important to keep in mind. Um, there has been concern expressed in the literature by polio survivors that health providers often know little about their condition. And this is important to understand. And certainly many of y'all already know that. It's kind of interesting. I got invited to do a talk and um, I'll be on a podcast in December that is sponsored by the um, the American Academy of Neurologic Physical Therapists, and they're doing a sequence on rare neurological conditions. And they asked me to be a part of that to talk about post-polio syndrome. And the funny thing is, I knew that when we're looking at the big scheme of you know, how many patients have stroke and how many people have multiple sclerosis and how many people have low back pain and whatever else, we know that um, polio survivors are very much in the minority in the United States and in the minority in a variety of other countries that have um, not had new polio in many decades. Um, but I had never really thought of the condition as being rare, but in retrospect, it's like, yeah, I, I guess it is. And so, you know, when, when we're training our young um, people to become physical therapists and, you know, and medical students are in medical school, you know, they've got all this information they're trying to learning and, and, you know, a lot more attention is spent to the things that people, that health professionals are going to more commonly see. And that's unfortunate for you when you're trying to access health, whether it's, you know, physical therapy or whatever else. So there can be misunderstandings. Um, and then, you know, certainly we need to work to have more dynamic education for health providers. 
I can tell you that my students get a fair dose of information about post polio syndrome um, every year. So let's talk about falls. So I'm not asking you for a hand raise or anything, but you know, it's something for you to consider and something that physical therapists need to explore with you is have you fallen? And you know, frequently I'll get, um, well, you know, I don't really fall. Okay, have you fallen is a yes, no question. It's not a, it depends question. Um, so it's important to understand that a fall is considered any unplanned trip to the floor or other lower surface, okay? And so, um, you know, have you had these experiences? And so how often do those occur? You know, is this something that happens once a day, once a week, once every two months? You know, did I have six falls in the last year? That kind of thing. And also has the frequency, um, is it the same or is it worse or is it better than last year? And so I think that this is something that'd be very helpful for each of you here in the audience to log, you know, however, it, it, you know, if you have any kind of a journal or a diary or anything like that to just record, you know, what your falls were, when they were, what you were doing at the time, the circumstances and all that to help you track it so that when you go to see your primary care doctor or your polio doctor or whoever, you be able to give them that kind of information. So certainly when we have people whose fall frequency is worse, that's bad. That's a clear sign that something is not going well for you, whether you're weaker or maybe you're not using enough equipment or something like that. Now, if your fall frequency is better, so, so obviously that is better, but uh, that might not be that you have a better, better physical situation. It may be that you are now not doing as much because you are choosing not to do things because you don't want to fall or you're fearful of falling. And we know that people, as they become more sedentary, um, they may have less opportunities to fall than some of our more active people. But then when those more sedentary people do get up and move, then that can put them at higher risk for falling as well. So that is something that we need to explore as well. And then also, have you required any medical attention due to a fall? Um, you know, have you broken any bones or, you know, sprained anything? We've had some patients that have had a, a brain injury or concussion from falling and those kinds of things. And then also important to consider is about near falls. And so this would be any time that you've caught yourself on the door frame or a piece of furniture or your significant other's arm, but had that door frame furniture or your significant other not been there, you would have gone down to the floor. So that's important to be tracking as well. And how often does that occur and has that frequency changed? And again, what are your circumstances of fall? That's very important for providing this information to your healthcare providers. So there are certain risk factors for falls that are documented in the literature. And this these are general um, for people who are aging and not specific necessarily to people with post-polio syndrome. But we all have personal risk factors. And so aging is one. As we get older, we're more likely to fall because, oh, by the way, we are tending to get a little bit weaker. Our balance is not quite as good. Oh, note that on here, in addition to weakness and impaired balance, vision problems is on there. So vision is a very important part of our our ability to maintain balance and not fall. And if we're, uh, if we have uncorrected vision because we have um, a progressive condition or we don't have enough money to get new eyeglasses and things, that can be a big issue. Um, low blood pressure, if I become lightheaded, if I'm confused and I'm not paying attention to where I'm going. But certainly, again, depression is one um, risk factor for falls as well. Um, then environmental risk factors include poor lighting, especially as we get older, we do rely on our vision more for getting around and for balance. People that have loose rugs and extension cords, um, those are big, big um, uh, uh, fall risks. And I've had people, well, you know, I spent $3,000 on this, you know, special rug. Well, you know, $3,000 for the special rug is a lot less expensive than the hospital bills that go with you know, a fractured hip, basically. So, you know, really think about minimizing all those things that you could be tripping upon. Wet flooring, you know, if there's a spill, get it cleaned up immediately. But then there's other times where maybe you have a pet that is incontinent or maybe a family member that's incontinent or, you know, there's, there's a variety of things. So that's super, super um, important to be on top of. Clutter, you know, if there's things that are sticking out that you can trip on or your walker leg could trip on or anything, that's going to be um, a bad for falling. And then, you know, commonly I interact with people that have lack of accessibility when they're using their wheelchairs or their walkers or whatever. And it's it's amazing to me that people are in homes 
for a long time. And it's like, uh, it's not like they woke up yesterday and now I'm using this wheelchair, but you know, maybe they've been using this wheelchair for a decade, but still their bathroom is inaccessible. You know, I'm not clueless. I realized that um, changing um, bathrooms can be very, very expensive, but there are some fairly simple modifications that can be done um, that don't cost a whole lot that may be adequate to meet a lot of people's needs. It's also important to understand that you know about osteoporosis or osteopenia, which is the precursor to osteoporosis and looking at reduced bone density, because um, when people do fall, especially as all of us get older and especially our ladies, but not just our ladies in the post-polio population, um, everybody is at higher risk for fracture and that's super important. So it is important to get screened for osteoporosis and to have that osteoporosis or osteopenia managed by your prim primary care doctor um, to keep your bone health as good as possible. So how can PTs help with falls? So we want to review these personal environmental risk factors with you. And are any of them changeable? Are any of them treatable? And can we help you with that or guide you in ways that can be helpful? Um, can we make, we can make rec recommendations and generate prescriptions for needed equipment and train you how to use them. Things such as bathroom grab bars, shower chairs or benches, elevated toilets. How about ramps and handrails? or handrails for steps, and then orthoses or braces for safer walking, and wheelchairs for locomotion, and lifts. Um, <clears throat> we can help you by starting a customized exercise program for gentle strengthening, endurance, balance, and improved physical activity, if able. And we do need to include how to get up from the floor. And this is definitely an issue that a number of people that come into our clinic have expressed to me. And just last month, I had a lady, yeah, you know, the way I've been getting up from the floor before, it's no longer working for me. You know, can you can you show me a, another way I can do that? And it's like, sure. And so I kind of demonstrate for her what, you know, kind of pretending like I was her, basically. She goes, oh, I'd like to try that right now. Yes, let's try that right now. You know, so, you know, we can we can work with you on that. I do have people that um, are not able to get up from the floor by themselves, and um, some of them have chosen to rent um, Hoyer lifts or mechanical lifts where a sling would get put underneath you. It, it is important if you get one of those that the, that the lift can go all the way to the floor if this is something that you're using it for. But I do have um, a few clients that continue to fall. They're not walking anymore, um, but they've had some incidents where they've fallen during transfers and such. And their 80 year old spouse is able to operate the lift to help get them up instead of having to call 911. Um, so what is your safety system in case of falls? So do you always, always, always have your cell phone on your person? And then what about when you, you might say, yes, I do. But what about when you're going to the bathroom or showering? Obviously we're not gonna shower with our cell phones, but if you were to fall in the shower, are you gonna be able to reach your phone You know, if you were to fall? And, or what if you fall and you land with kind of a high velocity type fall and then your cell phone goes flying somewhere? Are you gonna be able to access that to call for help? And have you considered an emergency button system? Like uh, not to promote any certain products, of course, but there are a number of different mobile alert uh, lifeline type systems where you can wear kind of like a necklace or a pendant or a bracelet or something. You know, it's kind of a help by falling, I can't get up type button. Um, there is a cost that goes with those obviously, uh, but those costs have come down over time. Some people wear different activity watches that can have fall or health monitoring systems uh, as part of that. And those can be very, very helpful use of current technology as well. Bottom line is you wanna be able to call for help. Um, so true story, years ago, I had a lady, she was not a polio survivor, but she was an older woman who was widowed. She lived in a rent house, never had any children. You know, she had neighbors. She'd been in the same rent house for years and years. Um, and her neighbors realized they hadn't seen her car leave the garage because she kind of had her routine where she would go to the grocery store on Tuesdays or whatever. Realized they hadn't seen her moving around a lot. So um, one of the neighbors called 911. They broke into her house and she had fallen in the bathtub and been in the bathtub for three days and couldn't get out of the bathtub. Could She hadn't broken anything, but she physically could not get out of the bathtub and she couldn't reach a phone to call for help. So she was malnourished, dehydrated. And of course, you know, if you can't get out of the bathtub, you can't get anything to eat or drink or go to the bathroom without going to the bathroom in the bathtub too. So um, we were able to help her get better, but you know, I certainly don't wanna see anybody else have to go through that kind of an incidence. 
So we can do functional training and help you with body mechanics. So, you know, has there been a functional loss? And so people might tell me, oh, I can't walk as far as I used to. Well, that doesn't tell me a whole lot. So uh, I try to help people get more concrete. So how far can you walk today? Oh, I can walk to the end of my driveway and pick up the newspaper and come back. Okay, good. So how far could you walk three years ago? Oh, well, I was able to walk to the end of the block and back. Okay, so that gives me a very concrete way to document what your decline in your walking ability has become. So that's very helpful. You know, it, it, it doesn't matter to me as much Certainly it's interesting that, oh, you played, you know, college level football or whatever, but, you know, what you did 40 years ago is not as relevant to me as what you were able to do three years ago or five years ago. Are there various activities that you were able to do before, but now they're kind of unsafe for you or they're causing you pain? That's important for you to share with the physical therapist and your doctor. Um, we can provide a number of um, joint protection strategies, you know, pre and post arthritis diagnoses. A lot of our folks have degenerative joint changes from the chronic overuse of certain body parts to compensate for other things that are going on in their body. Um, and we also want to try to help you to avoid muscle overuse with muscle reeducation strategies. So with functional training, looking at walking training. So again, has there been that functional loss and is your old equipment causing you problems? I mean, I've had patients who, who um, their braces are no longer fitting or maybe the braces weren't set right to start with and now they're having more problems with it. Um, do you need new equipment and do you need training for that new equipment? And maybe it's not just a replacement equipment, but maybe it's a replacement with an upgrade type of equipment. So it's going to be uh, important to learn how to use your things appropriately. Some people are walk walking functionally. You know, I'm going to go get my meal out of the refrigerator or I'm going to go answer the door and I'm going to walk to do that. But some people may, may be using their wheelchairs for their primary locomotion, but they might still be walking for planned exercise purposes. And so it's important for us as PTs to make that distinction with you to see what your goals are and what your walking, walking things are. Um, can you load your walker or what other equipment you're using into your vehicle? Some of the walkers can be quite heavy or bulky and, or with your balance problems, it just makes it very hard for you. Are you able to drive with your brace on or do you have to take your brace off? And that's going to be very inconvenient for a lot of people. And so it's important that we do include balance training, fall prevention, and environmental assessments with our folks who are walking. So some folks with the wheelchairs, um, having a wheelchair that has um, adjustable axle and wheel alignments and uh, adjustable sizes is good because that can help with optimizing your push stroke mechanics. And especially that's going to be really important to try to prevent shoulder injuries and things. And then folks with power wheelchairs, um, there's so many features with the power wheelchairs these days, but, you know, the maneuverability of different kinds of power wheelchair designs. And then have you had a functional loss and now you need new features with your wheelchair or now you're having some pain issues related to seating? And can you transport your wheelchair? You know, if you have a manual chair, are you able to load it yourself or do you have to have somebody to load it for you? Certainly um, transporting power wheelchairs is very, very difficult for uh, many people to do. And it, it might prevent them from being able to use these devices in their communities. Uh, with transfers, do you need a new method due to new problems? You know, oh, you know, I've got all this shoulder pain when I do my transfer. You know, so is there something that me as your physical therapist can help you to problem solve and try to figure out new strategies to do a transfer. Well, you know, this is the way that works the best for me. Well, maybe this is the way that worked the best for you starting three decades ago, but now it's not working great for you because of new pain problems or whatever. What about, you know, getting out of the bathroom and then, you know, when people um, are not able to lift their bottoms up very much, you know, getting their pants up and down can be a big issue. What about car transfers? I've had people talking about not necessarily worrying about test driving a vehicle so much, but test transferring into a car to make sure that the seat height is conducive for them getting in and out of the car um, on their own. That can be a big issue. And then being able to move yourself in bed for comfort and um, just being able to get out of bed on your own. That's super important as well. Pain management. So is this a, an acute or a chronic issue? Because those are going to be treated very, very differently. And what is the causes of these? So on the left, you see a picture. There's um, This was from a young man. He was in his 20s when I saw him. <clears throat> and he uh, walked full time with bilateral crutches and bilateral long leg braces, as you, as you see depicted there. Um, I apologize for the quality of the pictures from a Polaroid camera, if you can imagine that. 
but the shoes are um, both on the floor, but you can see that the hip segments of these braces are completely and totally different. And so basically every time he landed his feet, um, his pelvis was getting twisted with each landing and he was having low back and sacroiliac pain. And so I could have sent him to the best physical therapist in the world to help him with his low back and sacroiliac pain, but if we hadn't realized that his braces were set inappropriately, whatever fix the PT could have done would have been a temporary fix. So it is important to look at, again, old pieces of equipment and let's get this changed. Um, on the far right, you see a wrist that's in quite a bit of extension. And so a lot of people will be using crutches or canes or walkers. And if that wrist is in a whole lot of extension like that, that can contribute to either wrist pain or carpal tunnel problems. So there are different um, handle types that are available that can help you to have your wrist in closer to a more neutral alignment, which can be helpful from a pain standpoint as well. So with interventions, the, you know, there's cold or heat that can be used. There's magnet therapy. That ha there's a, a, an article that Dr. Valbona did a long time ago related to that. And then there's tins that some people have used for pain, which can be helpful. Uh, physical therapists can also help you to work to inhibit muscle spasms by doing things like soft tissue or myofascial releases. And again, the muscle re-education. If you have some edema, that edema can be... Um, inflammatory to the surrounding tissues. And so if we can reduce that edema, that can help with some pain and also make it easier for you to move. If you've got a lot of edema or swelling in the limb, that makes that limb heavier to move. We can also look to mobilize or stabilize joints. So um, frequently we're looking at stabilizing joints that are hypermobile because of years of compensation, but sometimes we can also mobilize them. We want to try to avoid painful end ranges. And then Increasing pain or numbness that occurs at night may be an indicating a mattress that is too firm for you and your body. So with energy conservation, with fatigue, is this a generalized fatigue, like your whole body, including your brain, and you feel like you have a brain fog, or is it more of a localized muscular fatigue, where now your leg feels like a noodle and you can't stand on it properly? So those will be treated differently. We look at pacing of activities with rest and um, I really encourage people to use a timer on their phone, on their computer, you know, anything is like, okay, when that timer goes off, you need to stop, sit down and rest. And the funny thing is, this is things that we know um, with regular people that do repetitive work. Like if you are an accountant and you are at a computer all day, we know that even people that are at a computer all day, they should be taking a sitting rest um, and just, you know, rolling their shoulders and turning their head back and forth, standing up for a minute, sitting down. And polio survivors should be doing the same thing, whether it's computer or doing the housework or whatever, you know, every hour on the hour, you should be stopping whatever that activity is, resting whatever muscles you're using before you continue on. There's the idea of sleep quality and quantity. So how long are you sleeping? And when you're sleeping, how deeply are you sleeping? So that's gonna be important for how restful you can feel um, or rested you can feel as you start the day. There's the concept of sleep hygiene, and that has to do with, you know, what routines do you have as you start to get ready for bed? Um, some people might meditate, some people might pray, some people might read a book. Um, we do know now that anything that is backlit, like a computer, an iPad, um, <clears throat> a Kindle, um, you know, any of these kind of devices that have a lot of light that stimulates our eyes and it stimulates parts of our brain that go with wakefulness, basically. And so it's important to turn, you know, have your eyes away from these things, especially up close things like computers and iPads and things and phones away from your eyes um, for a certain period of time before you go to bed. And then if you are waking up in the middle of the night, don't just, you know, go back on your computer and spend a couple hours doing that. That's, again, not going to be helpful for your sleep. Anyway, there's a variety of strategies that we can talk to you about. So the idea of weight control or weight reduction, certainly I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a dietitian, but, um, and so we might be referring you out for that kind of counseling. There is a very nice chapter in the book that Dr. Richard Bruno uh, wrote about nutrition, and it gives some suggestions for uh, types of calories and, and your nutritional needs as a polio survivor. And then if you have additional uh, medical conditions, such as diabetes, for example, it is important to share um, the chapter such as that one that's in that book with your dietitian who's helping you to manage your diabetes so that you can um, uh, work to get the information that you need. Orthoses, I work with people with orthoses all the time. I'm in close contact with a variety of orthotists throughout the state of Texas and sometimes outside of the state of Texas. 
And then again, from an energy conservation standpoint, motorized assistance can be very, very helpful for a number of people. And we also understand that acceptance of orthoses or any of these other aids that I've mentioned can be very, very difficult for many people to accept. So to exercise or not exercise, that is the question. And I'm sorry that I missed the exercise um, virtual town hall meeting that y'all had previously. And I think I'd probably need to go back and um, look at the recording of that. Um, but one of the things we know from Dr. Richard Bruno's book is his golden rule that if an activity causes increased pain, weakness or fatigue, don't do it or do much less of it. So with exercise, it depends. Now I've been told, uh, I've been told by a number of polio survivors, I've been told I should never exercise ever again. Now, frequently those people got that information in the 80s when post polio syndrome was first being discovered, if you will, as a syndrome. Um, but I think that now uh, we are taking a more individualized and customized approach to the idea of exercise. I'm not saying that everybody that has a polio history or everybody that has post polio syndrome should exercise or can exercise. But I think never is a very, very big word, and we need to explore that on an individual basis. So important things to know is that signs of muscle overuse includes muscle cramping that occurs at rest or during activity, particularly at rest, muscle twitching. And that doesn't mean like the, muscle, the, the limb jerking. That means more like, you know, how sometimes your eye will twitch a little bit if you're fatigued. If you get those kind of like little twitches, like under your skin with your legs, your arms or whatever, that's what we're talking about more. And then certainly the progressive weakness. So when should exercise not be used? It should not be used when you're in a period of new or active decline with aggressive symptoms. That's a bad time to start exercise, but also it should not be used for weight reduction. Again, it should not be used for weight reduction. All right, exercise should be targeted to specific needs of a person and for muscles that are stable or deconditioned, such as those muscles that are recovering after an illness or an injury. Or maybe, you know, after you had your total knee replacement, you need to go through your total knee rehab, that would be appropriate. Or if you've had a stroke on top of your history of polio, that would be a time where you need physical therapy. Or maybe you're um, a cancer survivor and you had chemotherapy and all that, then that would be a time that exercise could be a beneficial thing to you. Uh, unfortunately, there's very few studies that are out there that talk about the safety and the dosage and things like that of exercise in polio survivors, and especially those of you that have post-polio syndrome. However, there are a few small studies. So um, as documented with aerobic exercise, aquatic, um, strengthening, whole body vibration, and then respiratory training as well. So physical therapists can help you to reach your exercise and physical activity goals through a customized approach and careful, careful, careful monitoring. You have to be explicit. You need to be very upfront with the physical therapist. If any of your symptoms worsen after a PT session or performance of your home exercise program or any other physical activity, bottom line is PTs are going to be making professional guesses on which exercises might help and the dosage of those exercises. And so you're going to be needing to help them to titrate your exercise dosage. Kind of like when you're working with your doctor to titrate your medications. Oh, you know, I've got nerve pain. I'm taking this medication for nerve pain, but it makes me too sleepy. I can't function. Okay, well, how about if the doctor takes that dosage down a little bit to see if you get the benefits of the nerve pain reduction without the sedating side effects, that kind of thing. So kind of work with your physical therapist in the same way related to your exercise dosage. So exercise can help with pain management. So try to be open to the idea of exercise to help you with the pain. Um, symptomatic muscles should be exercised only to train muscle relaxation or those kinds of things for pain management. But we do need to look for ways to unload already stressed joints and overworked muscles. It would be helpful if you completed a daily log of your activities and symptoms and uh, rate them according to that. It would be very helpful for the physical therapist to help you um, through this process. So also with general health behavior. So again, uh, nutrition and weight reduction. I already mentioned that, um, that chapter in Dr. Bruno's book, um, the sleep hygiene. I already uh, mentioned that. But you know, you know, is it issues with falling asleep? Is are you having issues with staying asleep or getting back to sleep if you do wake up? And then what interferes with sleep? Is it because you can't turn your mind off? Is it because you're not breathing properly, because you have sleep apnea? Is it because um, uh, you have pain that's interfering with sleep? There's a variety. Do you have to go to the bathroom four times in the night? There's a lot of different things that can be happening during sleep, that, and some of them are very treatable. And again, mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, and stress can very, very much interfere with your ability to sleep. 
y'all walk a fine line between doing too much and not doing enough. But I think bottom line is you have to listen to your body and use your common sense. So there's been a number of technological advances in a variety of ways. And so, you know, here we have a picture of an iron lung, and this is actually an iron lung that was in the basement at Tier Hospital. Um, and then uh, here we have a CPAP machine over on the far right that for many people have helped them to be able to breathe better, especially at night. There's been a lot of technological advances in the orthotic world. And so here's some pictures of some new um, energy storing and very lightweight um, types of devices for both AFOs as well as KAFOs, including with the KFOs, there's some that have computer actuated things that can really have, uh, that actually have stumble recovery features, which are very, very helpful. But you can see that this brace is fairly bulky and it can be, the weight of it can be cumbersome for some folks. Um, there's also a variety of uh, extra lightweight crutches that are available. There's non-custom ones. There's a couple of companies that I have mentioned here um, uh, for custom crutches as well as almost custom crutches. And I, those websites are active websites. I just checked the links right before the meeting as well as rolling walkers and rollators. Um, the walkers and rollers can vary a whole lot in weight, so be sure to find out what the weights are because you might find them to be helpful to walk with, but if you can't get it in your out of your car, that could be a problem. And then looking at power mobility, as you age, muscles and or joints can wear out, as you well know. And with power mobility, this can be an option for improved safety with fall prevention, energy conservation, and joint perfection, protection. Any kind of wheelchair, whether it's a manual wheelchair or power wheelchair or scooter, it does require a face-to-face -face appointment with your doctor and documentation for your need for use for mobility-related activities of daily living inside the home. Medicare could care less if you need this device to go shopping or to go to your daughter's house or any of that kind of stuff. They only care about what you need to use for your mobility related activities that I live in within the home. And those of you that are walking part time and riding part time, um, how much you're walking is very heavily scrutinized. So the documentation has to be super duper strong. Um, so you know about scooters and power wheelchairs. Good news is that um, the automatic high-low seats that for decades have been completely unfunded are now funded sometimes through Medicare and insurance. So that's a very, very positive thing um, to explore. There's things such as power tilt and power recline that can help people, especially those of you that have issues with fatigue and or pain issues. There's also power assist for manual wheelchairs. And I've got a couple of pictures on the next slide. But again, we need to consider how it can access the home and be useful in the community. So here are two types of, and I'm not promoting these particular products, of course, but just some options that are available. So there are some people that might not be ready to move into traditional power mobility and or there's no way that you'd be able to afford a van with a lift and all that. Um, and so these attach to the wheelchair and these are not good for people that are going to be doing a lot of outdoor services, especially with grass, gravel, um, you know, rutted type things. Um, these are really super good for level sidewalks and indoor surfaces, um, like going to conferences or going to Vegas or whatever it is that you like to do. Um, so the first one just attaches. It has a, um, it has a. Uh, uh, a, a device that you can do and it basically functions, helps you function as a motorized wheelchair. The one at the bottom are called e-motion wheels. So these are really interesting because you continue to push the wheels, but you can set it to give you like twice as much push or three times as much push for every push. So if I push, if I push once and normally that allows me to go five feet, then with these e-motion wheels, if I set it twice, if I push once, it allow me to go 10 feet rather than the normal five feet, for example. So those are nice options for some people. Bottom line is they're expensive, they're not well funded, and both of these are fairly heavy to load in and out of your car. So some additional technological advances, there's new technology for measuring swallowing for people that have swallowing issues. OT, you know, they're the experts with making um, upper extremity splints. And then there's also a variety of prefab splints that are available. There's a lot of different kinds of assistive devices that are available that you can order on, you know, by mail order. Um, I encourage a lot of the folks that come to the clinic to use the pre-prepared pre, pre, pre -prepared produce and ready-to-cook meals. 
you know, curbside pickup, curbside delivery, home delivery, you know, that really picked up a lot during the pandemic. The pandemic, of course, was awful, but, you know, the prevalence of curbside pickup and home delivery being normal or being okay is really, really good. And I know a lot of people who don't have disabilities that really enjoy these services as well. Um, advances have also been made um, for many people, like with voice control products. And, you know, we kind of, my husband and I kind of laugh when we go to one of our kids' house and, you know, one of the kids will say, hey, Google, turn a timer for 10 minutes. I'm like, can't you set your own timer? You know, <laughs> but these, you know, types of things can be very, very beneficial people for people that have mobility problems and, and things like that. E-readers like such as, and again, I'm not promoting any particular products, but such as Kindles, you know, they're so lightweight for people. You can adjust the size of the font and those kinds of things. Um, so there's a variety of things that are very helpful for folks. And then the driving adaptations and wheelchair loading options have greatly expanded over the years. Clearly, you know, things are very expensive, but as technology um, becomes more mainstream, the prices do come down and there's a variety of ways that people can drive. So um, I just I, I think it's really cool that Brian asked me to speak for y'all. He wanted me to talk to y'all sometime in October, but October just happens to be um, National Physical Therapy Month in the United States. So that's just kind of fun that this happened in the month of October, just barely, but we still made it. And also last Saturday was Global PT Day of Service, where physical therapists from all over the planet were encouraged to do some things service related for their communities. Um, and so I just want to let y'all know about that as well. So that's the end of my formal presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing and then we'll be able to open things up for questions. All right, thank you very much, Carolyn, for that terrific presentation. Um, see, we have a, a couple questions already in the Q&A. Um, just, again, just a reminder, you can type it in the Q&A feature, you can, or you can just hit the raise hand feature and I'll try to call on you. Um, so Tim Brown had a question uh, that you put in earlier. Uh, he says, how do you determine when PT might be harmful rather than helpful for someone with PPS? Uh, also, did you say that you have experience with PPS patients who do not continually decline and who might actually improve? Yes, I do have experience with people who have the official diagnosis of post polio syndrome who are not declining and are actually improving. I do. Um, those people have been able to make certain lifestyle modifications. Um, and of course, as folks are getting older, you know, some of them are retiring because they are just of the age to retire, not because they're retiring because of medical reasons. And so, so sometimes their retirement in and of itself, depending on what kind of work they did, can be a helpful thing. Um, some people have become more open-minded to, you know, uh, use certain kinds of equipment that may be helpful. I'm not saying that everybody's cases, but that is some people's cases. So the, the first question or the first part of the question about how do you know if PT is being harmful to you? So if we go back to the golden rule, you might not know if, like, let's say that you've gone to your doctor and you think you, you might need exercise, or maybe the, the doctor says you need physical therapy for whatever, I, I think one is um, it's it will be hard for most people to find a post polio expert in physical therapy just because, again, y'all are so much in the minority for the types of patients that we see that that there are a lot of people that, you know, they might have been in the profession for 10 years or 20 years, but they might have not ever seen anybody who was a polio survivor or they might have seen one person. So there's that issue. Um, but I also I also, uh, and I and I encourage people to go to different kinds of physical therapies. And of course I have my like cadre of people that I like to refer people to on a regular basis. Um, I will encourage people to go to see a neurologic physical therapist if they have a neurologic issue, such as if I want you to work on things like balance retraining, fall prevention, getting used to a new brace, getting used to a new piece of equipment, any of that kind of stuff. Um, I will refer you to a more of a neurologic physical therapist, but there's a lot of y'all that have a lot of joint pain and, you know, um, clear orthopedic problems that are related to your, 
years of compensation and that kind of thing. And I will actually refer those folks to very skilled orthopedic therapists. So, you know, you might be going to, you know, here in Houston, we've got Memorial Hermann Ironman and sports physical therapy. And so I might refer you to Ironman sports and physical therapy. And so you're in this gym with, you know, athletes and whatever, but I will refer you to those places when I know the people that work there. And I know that they, because those people have very good clinical decision making abilities and can treat complex cases. So um, I will, you know, when I have people in the clinic, I'll encourage them to go to this type of a person or that type of person. There's also in our field, there are people that have selected specialties and I will encourage people to try to find people with those specific specialties. So for example, if you fit into that first bunch of patients that I talked about that need you know, a, a gentle strengthening program, some balance re-education, that kind of stuff, then I would encourage you, like when you call for the appointment, you know, check with the clinic that's close to your house. Because you know, if you have to drive an hour and a half to get there, you might not benefit as much from it from a fatigue standpoint. Um, but see, hey, do you have anybody that has a neurologic clinical specialist on your, on your staff? Great, I want an appointment with that person, okay? Or if or if you're going to an orthopedic place, do they have somebody that is an orthopedic clinic specialist or do they have, there's different orthopedic credentials. So there's different specialty letters that go behind their names, but somebody that specializes in some aspect. So that means that this person has some level of expertise over the regular physical therapist that you might interact with. Bottom line is whoever the PT is, they have to be able to listen to you and help you to work through your issues, okay? All right, thank you. Um, I am. I saw Ronnie Morris had his hand raised. I'm gonna go to him now. Ronnie, are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, one point I had. Um, I can't see you. Um, so I don't know. Um, at this point. Um, anyway, one point uh, I noticed that was not covered in the uh, presentation is pelvic floor therapy. And I believe that's a specific like subclass of physical therapy. Is that correct? You are absolutely correct. And um, pelvic pelvic floor therapy, there are physical therapists that specialize in that area of practice. And typically that they could be in a regular outpatient therapy clinic, or they could be in a urologist office or a gynecologist office. Um, and the pelvic floor therapist should be skilled in working with not only female patients, but also male patients as well. Um, I'm treated at the University of Michigan, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a really uh, great physiatrist, um, and we have Risa Laidlaw. And um, I'm going to talk about a couple of pelvic floor topics, if that's okay. If you think it's not appropriate, let me know. Um, but I get pelvic floor therapy um, through the hospital. Um, I was tested because I had difficulty with bowel movements. And I was there's a test that was given. And I have paralysis on the right side of my body. And specifically, I have uh, some paralysis in my rectal sphincters. And so I go in and I have to go in for rectal dilations. So I just throw that out. If other people have that issue, it's sometimes difficult to talk to, but they can actually test for that and uh, diagnose and treat it. Um, the second issue I had uh, was urological. And um, when I was going in for a scoping for prostate issues, um, the urologist could not get the scope to go through because the lower valve, that's a voluntary valve, you have two um, in your uh, bladder, one at the top, one at the bottom. Uh, the top one, uh, you can't control, that's just, uh, I think the word's autonomic. Um, the lower one is the one you do control. Mine doesn't open and close correctly, specifically it's difficult to open, and he said it is paralysis that is common to um, post polios, Parkinson's, AD ALS patients, and MS patients. Um, there's a couple of treatments for it, uh, a couple of treatments in terms of uh, pharma pharmacological. Um, you can take alpha blockers, which I couldn't tolerate. So now I'm on a very low dose of Valium uh, to release that valve, uh, which Valium can have other issues for post polios, but this is a very, very low dose and it does seem to be working. Um, he said, I, I was told that 
at some point, if it discontinues working, um, then the only uh, the only uh, uh, procedure is you have the uh, that valve uh, um, sort of elect electrocuted and it doesn't work anymore, and so you have to wear a uh, um, a catheter. Um, there's like for males, there's an external catheter. Um, so those well, are a I'm couple sorry. issues. I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm, I'm sorry that you're having these issues, but I'm glad that you're getting the care that you need. Um, and I'm glad that you raised the topic because I know that some people, um, there can be stigma associated or embarrassment associated with um, discussing that with your primary care doctor. So it is very important to discuss that with your primary care doctors and or your physical therapist. And, you know, many, like I don't have expertise in that particular area. Um, I do know that a number of people um, can have issues um, simply because they're getting older. Sometimes it could be related to the history of polio, although many times, most of the time, the polio was is really an odd virus because it, it tended to hit the nerves that go to the skeletal muscles and not so much to the smooth muscles that would include the muscles related to bowel and bladder function. However, um, I do know for sure that um, a lot of the pelvic floor muscles and then those pelvic floor muscles, you know, support those structures that you're talking about. And if you have weakness in those pelvic floor muscles, which are skeletal muscles, that can cause problems kind of all the way up and down, you know, that chain basically. And there are some exercises that can be done to help strengthen some of those pelvic floor muscles um, as well. Last um, uh, comment. Uh, the primary cause I had for falling the last couple of years, um, and I am somewhat mobile, I can walk, I wear an AFO, but I also use a, a cane periodically as well. Um, but I actually, it sounds stupid, but I was tripping over my shoelaces and did some research, and there's a couple of very inexpensive uh, uh, mecha little mechanical things you can put on your shoelaces to make sure you tie them well. I have arthritis in my hands, so tying shoes is kind of difficult and to get the knots tight. But there are some uh, some really nice little, uh, and they're very inexpensive to talk. Yes. Um, Thank you for sharing that. That's it from Grozio, Michigan. All right. Thank you very much. I um, Let's see. Let's go back to the chat. Um. Dolores asks, can you say more about high-low seat lifts? Uh, yes, I'd be happy to. So some of y'all might be um, familiar with the recliners that are advertised on TV where they kind of pop you up and then you can sit down in them and all that. But there are automatic high-low lifts that can be put onto, they, they can't be retro put onto a, an existing scooter or an existing wheelchair. Um, they have to be ordered at the same time. But basically, you know, let's say that you're in a regular wheelchair height and then you go into your kitchen and you want to be able to reach something that's in your upper cabinet, for example. So some people can just push a button, go it's like a little elevator, basically. And then maybe you can reach the stuff that's in the in the cabinet, for example. Um, I also have patients that they are they are only able to be independent with their transfers if those transfers are exactly level or maybe even a little bit downhill. So I have some people that, and if, 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 the, if there's any slight incline that they can't do it by themselves and they have to get somebody to help. And you know, one, th one thing we know about polio survivors is they're fiercely, fiercely independent. And so the high-low seat can be used, um, let's say you've got your bed at whatever height and your normal wheelchair height is a little bit lower than the bed. So I can bring the, the, the wheelchair up to the height of the bed to make it level, or maybe I can even go higher than the bed so I can kind of slide down to get into the bed. But then I, if I need that downhill transfer, then I can lower that wheelchair to go lower than the bed and have them slide down from the wheelchair, I'm sorry, from the bed into the wheelchair. So I have people that use those high-low um, seats for that reason as well. Also, sometimes, you know, do you get tired of being kind of the same height with your head as everybody else's rear ends. Sometimes it's nice to have a high-low seat where you can get actually get more closer to eye level to the people that you're with, you know, be it a professional or a social situation as well. Hey, great. Um, I'm gonna sort of combine a 
a okay. few questions here because there's several questions that are sort of in the same vein. Okay. Um, but they're all sort of about how do I go about you know finding a physical therapist in, in their area mm -hmm. that maybe not is you know maybe they're not a post polio expert, but they have some uh, you know okay. pretty good at treating neuromuscular disease or might have you know some basic working knowledge of post polio syndrome. So. Um, the American Physical, Physical Therapy Association has a website, and it's APTA, American Physical Therapy Association, APTA.org. And on that website, there is a find a PT part of the website. So that could be a very good place to start. Um, if you, if you're not, the thing is, you have to, people have to be a member of the American Physical Therapy Association to be listed on that site. And unfortunately, about half of the people who are PTs are not a member of the American Physical Therapy Association. So there could be some very skilled people in your community that are just not listed on that site. Um, another thing that could be a very helpful thing for you to do is if there is a um, university center close to where you live, um, where there's teaching hospitals and there are, uh, maybe there's schools of physical therapy there. Um, if you contact, if you go onto the website of that university and you see that there's a school of physical therapy, you can, um, you just kind of scroll through the faculty and you'll see whoever it is that's, you know, does neuro. And then you can just, you know, call them or email them and say, Hey, you know, I live 30 minutes away and I need a, a neurophysical therapist. You know, can you, uh, give me somebody's name? And contact information. That would be another way. Great. Um, so a question from Warren. I know you have some you've done some work in this area. He, he asked, "Do you have any recommendations for whole body vibration?" Well, that's a whole other topic, and I would encourage you because I know that um, PHI has their articles that were published archived on the website, and I wrote. I think it was a pretty good article <laughs> about yes. this. <laughs> about the study that I did. And actually, in some ways, that article was kind of a better article, if you will, than the scientific manuscript that was published because of like word counts and that kind of thing with the scientific manuscripts. But I went into quite a bit of detail about the types of machines that we used and the protocol that we used um, and how to build up, you know, to using it more. It also has the precautions or the contraindications for using it. So one of the big precautions is, do you have an active infection or do you have active cancer? That would be a bad thing. Also, if you have metal implants. So, you know, a lot of people have rods up and down their backs. Um, people can have, um, you know, fusions that were done and they've still got metal in their ankles and those kinds of things. So there are, uh, and I've never seen anything in the literature that said that the vibration can loosen up any of that hardware. But I think the thing is the people that have done the prior research were afraid that that could happen. And so um, that is one of the big precautions for sure. Yeah, thank you. And if uh, if anyone wants to read that article, if you go to uh, PHI's website, it would be under the research tab. And then uh, this the published research that we include in there, you'll scroll down a little bit and you'll, you should be able to find it fairly easily. Um, let's see. Uh, and I see the one about um, NMES and TENS. Yes, so I was just going to get to that. Yes. Yeah, so that's a good question. So NMES stands for neuromuscular electrical stimulation, and you may also hear people refer to it as FES or functional electrical stimulation. Those terms can be used interchangeably. The important thing about NMES or FES is that those are typically used for strengthening. It can also be used for um, edema reduction, but typically we are looking for muscle contractions to get more strengthening. So you need to consider that type of stimulation as a form of exercise. So, you know, if you're afraid of exercising, then I would stay away from the NMES. Now the TENS, and, and these are with surface electrodes. So they're electrodes that have some adhesive and they stick to your skin. The TENS also is gonna use the same type of electrodes, the same type of adhesive. It's also gonna be on top of your skin. And TENS stands for transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation. And this is designed for pain modulation. So the waveform that the machine is set at will be different in a way to stimulate more of the sensory nerves, more so than the muscles themselves, okay? Um, without going to a whole physics lecture about it, you just have to trust me on that. Now with a TENS unit, depending on the settings, you can get muscle contractions as well, um, but uh, that's not the 
and that can be beneficial for pain management. Okay, but it can also just be used at a sub um, a sub level where you're not getting muscle contractions and be beneficial for pain. Okay. Um, here's one. Um, I'm told I have to do weight bearing exercise to help my osteoporosis, and that is difficult. So, does vibration therapy help people like me? Well, that is what I'm hoping. Um, I had actually applied for several research grants to study that, and I was not able to get any of them funded. Um, I did start a case series research project, and my first person um, had to drop out of the study because she has a family history of breast cancer, and she had they had found a new lump, and we know that that diagnostic process. So I had to dismiss her from the vibration study. Um, I did have one other person that completed um, a long series and we looked at her bone density. Um, however, during her participation, this is during the whole COVID pandemic where her activity levels also changed quite a bit with the pandemic. Um, so we don't have clear uh, results from that as well. And I've uh, been attempting to recruit somebody else to do another case in this case series to look at the bone density and stuff, but I have not successfully found anybody that's willing to commit. The, the challenge with that, and I have a machine that I can deliver and put in somebody's home. Um, the challenge is that for bone changes to happen from vibration, well, even from medication, it takes months and months and months for the changes to happen. So it would be a long-term commitment. So, you know, I do have an interest in that area. And I think, um, I think it's definitely worth a try. Again, if you don't have the precautions that are listed in that article that Brian has told y'all about. All right, uh, so I'm gonna go to Maureen who has her hand raised. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, excellent. Um, I had polio when I was two in 1953. And only recently, within the past maybe two years, um, my left leg, which is the quote unquote bad leg, um, has been swelling more than my right leg, much more. And unless I keep it raised all day long and, you know, use my hands to push everything, you know, up to the hip. Um, that's the only thing that seems to work. Obviously, though, you know, we all live full lives and I can't be sitting down all day with the leg elevated. I've had ultrasounds done and nothing is going on in the leg. Do okay. you see any reason why one leg should be swelling more than the other? Oh, and yes. What do you do about it? <laughs> all right. So. We all know that our circulation happens because our heart pumps our blood through our bodies, right? Um, but we also have a fair amount of circulation that happens from our muscle pumps. And, and if you have one leg who, that has a lot of weakness or paralysis, you don't have maybe any muscle pump on that side or your muscle pumps that you have are a whole lot weaker than the other side. So it sounds like you know, the blood is just kind of going down there and kind of getting stuck there, basically. And it can yeah. also be lymph lymphatic fluid as well. OK, so it can be the lymph fluid or it can be the blood fluid that kind of gets stuck there and doesn't come back up on its own because your muscle pump is not like the other leg. So I'm glad that you've already been to your doctor and you've had some testing done to rule out things like blood clots and, and those kinds of things that can definitely happen. Um, so I think the, the, and I agree now, one thing is, okay, I'm, when I have my leg propped up, that doesn't help a lot. It's better than having your leg hang down, but it doesn't help a lot unless your leg is higher than your heart. And so, you know, if you're busy, obviously you're not going to have your leg higher than your heart. Most of the time that would be like maybe during nap time or, you know, at night. Um, but that would be maybe where could you use some electrical stimulation, you know, from a physical therapist to help get you know, to help get the fluids back up, you know, periodically during the day. Um, I'm an advocate of wearing support socks 
or support stockings. And, you know, you can get the hospital grade ones. You can also, you know, go on to your favorite mail order company and, and get support socks. And even like um, when I go on long flights, I, you know, even though I'm don't have a history of polio and I don't have circulatory problems other than, you know, varicose veins that I inherited from my mom. Um, I, you know, my legs swell because I'm not able to move for, you know, four hours or five hours or whatever. So, you know, I routinely wear support socks when I do my long road trips or my long airplane trips, just, you know, so I advocate for that. But if it's, you know, significantly bothering you, there are little machines that you can rent. Um, and you might have, I don't know if you've had loved ones that are in the hospital where they'll put a little um, sleeve kind of around the lower yes. leg. Yes. And then there's a motor that just kind of, you know, pumps and squeezes to prevent blood clots. So you can rent those for home use as well. And your doctor could prescribe that perhaps. What is that thing called, that machine? Uh, a compression device. So you're recommending support stockings or that compression device? Yeah, so, so I would start, you know, and, and now one of the things I'm having a hard time with with the clients that I see in the clinic is everybody's getting older and like, you know, the gentleman that was on the phone before, he's got arthritis with, you know, and it's it's hard to get down there and, put, you know, for the, the support socks to work, they have to be snug. And there's a fine line between having it snug and taking care of what you need to take care of and being too tight where it's almost impossible to get on or um, you also don't want it to cut off your circulation. So there's a little bit of trial and error that goes with um, getting, you know, something that fits you comfortably. So should that be done with a physical therapist? I would do that on your own. They're, they're not going to, they're not going to know name brand products. Um, you could also explore um, through your doctor, getting a referral to a lymphedema clinic to see, you know, even if you don't have the diagnosis of lymphedema, they can have some nice strategies to help get that fluid out for you. Is that going to be a temporary fix or is that going to be uh, permanent where it doesn't happen anymore? I'm guessing that some aspects of this would be a chronic thing, but I would think that they, you know, if we could get it where it's more manageable for you, that would be a goal. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. Um... I think we're just about out of time. Do you have time for one more question or? Yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, let's go to one last question. Let's go to John Dykstra. John, are you there? Hello, I'm John. I'm here. All right. Yeah. Here you. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, I get out of breath severely doing pretty simple things. And uh, would I, I assume exercise might help that some, but I, I've never, you know, had trouble breathing before I had the post polio symptoms stuff. But now it's uh, getting to where I get out of breath just transferring from the chair to the recliner, I mean, wheelchair to the recliner. And I, of course, several years ago, I quit walking because I just got weaker. And uh, I'm trying to retain at least what I have. So I don't want to just suffocate to death. So what can I do to help that? Well, hopefully you're being managed by your physician and you've seen a pulmonologist that is um, <laughs> skilled in your kind of condition. One of the challenges that we have found with pulmonology is that pulmonologists tend to be experts in treating lung tissue and lungs as an organ, but they may or may not be experts in um, helping people that have breathing muscle weakness as well. So you might have healthy lungs, but bad breathing muscles, or you could also have, you know, if, I mean, I had a lady who just got diagnosed with COPD, which is typically with smokers, but she's never smoked it before in her life. Um, so, you know, that, that's been a challenge. So one is making sure that you're getting the medical aspects managed as best as possible by hopefully a competent, um, uh, pulmonologist, that would be the first stop. Um, and then looking to see, are there some exercises that you could do, um, to help you to, um, maintain the breathing capacity that you have and, and maybe 
um, uh, improve it. Now, there's also a device, and forgive me because I'm drawing a blank on the name of it. Um, there's a device that hospital patients tend to get on a regular basis, and it's a little clear plastic thing with a tube that you 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 and you blow in it. Okay, and uh -huh. and you know, trying to you know blow past a certain number or whatever, you know, that could be a um, breathing exercise that you could do, and you could you know kind of track how your numbers are. So that would be something that you could talk to a physical therapist about, and again, your pulmonologist as well. But there, there are also um, um, little, like little tabletop bicycles that you can, you know, have your arms kind of pedal, and uh -huh. you can you can set that up with no resistance, or you can set it up with, you know, a variable amount of resistance, and that could be something that you could try as well. But I, I would guess that you actually going to outpatient physical therapy would be very hard because if you're getting out of breath just from transferring from your recliner chair to your wheelchair, getting in and out of a car um, and back and then doing whatever they're going to have you do would be very, very fatiguing for you. Right. Uh, yeah. And uh, is there any information that... Uh... I could uh, send him for, on the post polio syndrome stuff because there aren't many people around here that are familiar with that at all, and it's it's a big hospital here, but uh, right. they, they just run out of uh, patients <laughs> with that. Right, right. Fact, I... My my general practitioner doesn't uh, know much either, and I thought there might be some literature I could send these people. I would guess that through the PHI website, there's some articles about breathing and, and stuff. Yeah, we have uh, a lot of material. John, if you uh, want to contact us directly, um, I'm more than happy to send you a number of articles that uh, you could share. Oh, okay, great. Because, uh, you know, I've got a physical therapist comes to the house uh, twice a week right now. Wonderful. So I just got out of the hospital from, from the breathing thing, so. Oh, okay, okay. Well, did they give you one of those little things that you blow into? Uh, well, they gave me a thing you suck on. <laughs> okay, okay. So are you using it? Uh, no, I left it at the hospital. I forgot it there. <laughs> so I'm getting another one. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I also have spirometers here. So the, the ones you yes. blow into. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I can't get them out of the yellow. <laughs> okay, but, you know, you know, like I tell, whether it's, you know, exercise, you know, like, Two minutes of exercise is better than zero minutes of exercise. And guess what? Yellow, right. blowing to the yellow is better than blowing to the red line, I guess, right? So I guess so. <laughs> anything is better than zero, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks, John. I, I see another question here about um, resistance training and bone density and aqua therapy. Yeah, that was a spam call, I think. So, so another call came. Okay, um, so I, I see this other this other question about bone density. So, uh, there, to my knowledge, there is no um, evidence that says that water therapy will help you with osteoporosis. Um, you know, the the water provides a certain level of buoyancy, which is good from a joint protection standpoint and all that, but it's not good for promoting bone density. So, uh, I'm sorry about that. And then. Taking the drugs for density. And a number of people in the clinic expressed concerns about the different drugs for promoting bone density. But I think it's important to have that discussion with your primary care doctor because one, at this point in time, there's a variety of different kinds of drugs that are available to promote bone density. And if one of them causes you to have shortness of breath because you've got restrictive lung disease, you know, maybe the other one won't. So I think that would be a conversation to have with your primary care doctor um, to determine which one would have the least problems with that. I think it's bad to just generalize that I can't take any of these medications because I've got this condition. That's you know a conversation you need to have with your doctor because it could be that one of them is going to work for you well. In the meantime, you know, can you take calcium and vitamin D supplements just to um, you know keep things as healthy as possible in that regard? Oh, <laughs> UAB. 
I'm sorry. Did you did you see one you wanted to answer? Yeah, I just saw something on the. Okay, let's see. All right. So, can you recommend a good physical therapist in Birmingham, Alabama? Actually, I cannot, but they've got an excellent school of physical therapists there at UAB. So, you know, please reach out to the neuro person on their faculty and they'll be able to direct you that way. Uh, I might be coming through Dallas in the near future. Yeah, so um, we get people that come from out of state and out of town on a regular basis. So the big thing is making your appointment um, soon because there is a wait list to get into the uh, into our clinic. Um, depending on when it, it could be like a three or four month wait, um, but it would be good, like you said, if you're going to be Dallas anyway, you know, just can you drop down to Houston as well? Unfortunately, I don't know um, of anybody that provides the the type of care that we provide in Houston in the DFW area, and we get quite a few people from North Texas that come all the way down. Okay, great. Well, I think we are uh, just about out of time for today. Um, Carolyn, thank you so much for uh, your wonderful presentation and volunteering your time and expertise today. Uh, we really appreciate it. Um, and I want to thank everyone who joined us today uh, for your great questions um, and making this another uh, terrific event. Um, if you'd like to uh, support PHI and programs like this, you can go to PHI's website, which is post dash polio.org uh, click on the donate button um, again this uh, town hall and lecture series is brought to you by the Christopher and Dana Reeve Foundation um, so we thank them as well um, so again uh, you know thank you everyone and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day thank you and again my email um, uh, Brian has my email and you can also look me up on the School of Physical Therapy website um, at Texas Women's University and I'd be happy to answer questions that didn't get asked today. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.